Welcome to Business Innovators Radio, featuring industry influencers and trendsetters sharing proven strategies to help you build a better life right now. This is your host, Alicia DeBrill from Insight Media. Today's guest is Anna Lynchowski, otherwise known as Coach Lynch. She helps business and organizations develop their individual leadership potential of all their human capital. Her unique value proposition is founded on the idea of standardized empowerment. Because even the most average people can do extraordinary things to impact a business or organization when equipped properly. So without further ado, I want to welcome Coach Lynch to the show. Hi, Coach. Welcome to the show. Hi. Good morning, Alicia. How are you? Good morning. I'm good. So can you tell me a little bit about how you're helping businesses and organizations address leadership issues and personal and professional development? So I like to think that I bring an awareness to human capital and how it's being developed in businesses. And human capital is just the knowledge, talent, skills, abilities, intelligence, so on and so forth for all your individuals and teams in your business or organization. And when you combine all of this, it it really represents a power and a form of wealth that's available to organizations to accomplish their goals. So when you uh, think about it, you know, human capital and the way that it's developed and managed may be one of the most important factors of an organization's performance. You know, unfortunately, in today's culture, Human capital development, personal, professional leadership development, it's, it's undervalued, it's underinvested in, and in some cases, it's, it's even undermined, especially when you talk about leadership development. The big story is that, you know, most, most people don't think of themselves as leaders, and ones who think they are leaders may or may not be. So collectively, if you have people who don't think they could lead or people who think they can lead and aren't doing it so well, And these are the people who are helping operate or running most businesses. It it kind of puts the big picture into perspective. Makes sense. So can you describe the outcome that can be achieved by working with you as a coach? Sure. So there's a very well accepted principle. It's called the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. And I pretty much go against that. You know, I try to transform companies from having these individual silos of leadership development that's kind of exclusive. And I take them to a mainstream culture of potential development instead. And all I do is really create environments where success is is standardized and really expected at all levels, not just your C-level, managerial, executive, and up. I mean, going down to the entry level. And it's founded on a very basic philosophy, I guess you could say, you know, a rising tide lifts all sails. And I like to think of this as far as soft skills are concerned. And I always tell people that soft skills win where technical skills wane. And a lot of these companies are investing a lot of money into technical training. You know, like me, I was in finance. It was a lot of sales training and the stuff with the licensing and so on and so forth. But the soft skills, you know, stuff that I had to really learn when I went into business, very, very different. Every single person can be working on that. And it kind of shifts the mindset of the average person in an organization. It it makes them feel like they could be working on their company versus just in it. I like to think that, that what it is that I'm doing for these companies is making leadership, personal, and professional development part of the, the benefit package so that performance is optimized at every level. I completely agree. So describe the difference achieving this outcome. What kind of difference can this make in their lives? Not only you know professionally, but business-wise. So this is all about potential and possibility. And really the difference is between achieving that potential or that possibility or taking it to the cemetery, which is sadly what a lot of people and businesses do. I used to like math and there's this property called the transitive property of equality pretty much says if A is B and B is C, then A is C, right? If you apply this to to businesses, businesses are where most people work. And most people, sadly, are working below their potential. So it stands to say that businesses are arguably working and growing, for that matter, below their potential too. So 
How do businesses and organizations that hire you as a coach or a trainer, how are they going to really benefit from it? Because there's a ton of competition out there. So why are you the one? I just believe in fast tracking, you know, the fast track to successful organizational performance. And in layman's terms, it's sustainability. It's money and time. That's what every business owner and company and corporation is prioritizing. So when you talk about money as it relates to performance, some of my clients have called me a force multiplier. It's a military term. <laughs> I know. Go figure. Because I have no military experience whatsoever. <laughs> but I help them increase or multiply the effectiveness of every single person in that department, in that business, in that organization. And we'll do a couple of things, self-awareness projects, group coaching sessions, performance exercises, you know, role-playing, masterminding, assessments and so on and so forth. But there's an important assumption here, and it's that there's leverage between your, your average entry-level person in a company and extraordinary performance. And that leverage exists in empowerment, equipment, and accountability. So I was not a leader. I definitely became a leader by a byproduct. And I looked like any other employee or manager in, in any company for that matter. But I had good mentors. And I remember when I was working for the federal government, I was essentially put into positions I didn't really think I even belonged in, but I was equipped. So I rose to the occasion. I got better. And the results came when it counted, really. You know, we had some emergency situation when I worked for the federal government and we had to file this crazy injunction uh, within the same day, which is a very difficult thing to do. But the bottom line is we did it. It was me and the team of two or three other people. And we did it and it saved them time and money. So the point was I acted like a leader only when they sold me on their belief in me as a leader. They kind of created that uh, loyalty and dedication and they influenced me to perform better. And just really quick about time, you know, coaches a lot of the time aren't hired until after the problem is had and the damage is done. True. It, it's that third party perspective. You know, our, our sole role as coaches is to observe and question. It's very objective. So it, it presents opportunities to discover problems and solve them quicker. And then, you know, we're, we're sounding boards and accountability partners and all that good stuff. But I like to show people, hey, this is actually really important to build up front in your culture rather than after a problem occurs. <laughs> Well, that makes sense. And I love the fact that you're able to put things together so quickly and get things done when needed. That's a very important quality in a coach. Makes a huge difference in business. <laughs> it does. Time is money. So what are the advantages of personal and professional development in an organization? So I, I know I might be sounding a little redundant at this point, but again, most people won't untap their potential and they won't consider themselves a leader without help. And businesses have the opportunity to help them. They can help develop these people, which in turn help develop them. And I start with the individual because you have to be able to lead yourself first. You have to be able to grow beyond limiting belief. And every single performance issue in an organization boils down to a root <laughs> in every individual somewhere. Performance issues come from somewhere in all these people. So I transition, you know, we, we look at the individuals, we see what's going on and, and transition to work on those individuals so that they can duplicate and bring these concepts to the team. And then eventually throughout the entire organization, it compounds. It's important because when you talk about leadership too, eventually you have to get to the point where it includes other people. There's this saying, John Maxwell says that he says, leading without followers, it's just taking a walk. And it's true, <laughs> getting to the point where we can create a standard for leadership and personal development and professional development, where people take responsibility and ownership and pride in what it is that they do. It, it kind of shifts the workplace environment. It's not about the paycheck. It's about being passionate. And it really focuses shifts of, of leaders, too, because... So leaders have to take responsibility for developing people. And it's, it's, it's just a shift. It'll definitely save money on recruitment, hiring, you know, turnover, human resource issues, culture issues, so on and so forth. It definitely helps with skill development as far as communication, problem solving, 
emotional intelligence, self-motivation, so on and so forth. But I think the more important thing is that it really becomes a part of a company's best practices. You know, consumers will know when a culture like that is, uh, is shifting. Definitely. So what do you feel the biggest myths are when it comes to leadership? So there's a ton of them. In, in my world, people kind of assume that if you're an entrepreneur, you're a leader. Entrepreneurs, they, they just see and seize opportunities. Not all of them are good with people, but the, the entrepreneurs who are good leaders understand that they need other people who are good with people. Some people think that management is leadership and it's not. Leadership is all about influence, especially influence on, on other people to follow. And management is just maintaining those systems and processes and people. And sometimes people think that leadership is trend setting, pioneering, you know, being the first to do something. But again, it goes back to that issue of having people follow you. You need people intentionally following you and acting on that vision for you to be considered a leader. And then other things like knowledge, people equate intelligence, you know, IQ with leadership, especially when it comes to education and the ability to think and the ability to lead are just require different skills. And I would say lastly, uh, position, you know, titles and roles. You can find a lot of very quote unquote successful people who are ineffective leaders and, and opposite. You know, I always use Mother Teresa as an example because she was a phenomenal leader. But when you look at her, she didn't have money. She wasn't a millionaire. She had very lucrative organizations, but she lived in poverty and she had absolutely unbelievable influence. And that's what it is. Leadership is definitely influence. Unfortunately, in today's day and age, it is, uh, it is so limited. Well, I definitely relate to the analogy because I was raised Catholic and Italian. So <laughs> my grandmother used to 98 days being around with the rosemary <laughs> with her wheelchair. Um, so what are some of the most common fears that someone may have about hiring, you know, someone to help develop as an effective leader? Because that's an ego thing. Fears or misconceptions? A little bit of both, because I think the fears comes into the fact of that they don't know everything. Misconceptions is the fact that they don't. Sure. Fears are kind of the same across the board. You know, coaching is a behavioral practice. So people are always wondering whether or not it's beyond their ability, you know, to really change whatever it is that they need to to change and we take them through this process. You know, I always recommend journaling so that you can physically see where it is that you're coming from through this process of development. And they also wonder, you know, what if it doesn't work? Measurability, again, it's challenging in coaching, but I always tell people, what if it does work? You know, is, is the risk that you have to take to change and get to the next level worth the return, which is, you know, untapping this potential that you stand to make? I, I've heard of it. I don't think it's really mainstream, but some people think that there's this stigma like, oh my God, I'm struggling. I, I need a coach. And I'm a little biased, obviously. I'm in the industry, but we, we look at ourselves as partners, you know, the, the ones that aren't going to let you off the hook. So we're like the friend that you hate to talk to sometimes. <laughs> um, yes, I've been known as that once or twice. Yeah, yeah exactly. Because you don't want to make the excuses, you know, that, that's kind of what the problem is. There's a lot of stuff going on in companies, in organizations that prevent people from really looking into this stuff. And we're the ones who are saying, hey, now we need to look into it. And this is why. I know that there's um, some coaches, uh, you know, I don't personally do it, but they'll, they'll give advice or they'll relate an experience. And sometimes it's taken as a suggestion. I don't necessarily make suggestions as far as these business owners and leaders decisions are considered only because that's not what I think my job is. You know, so I set the expectations kind of up front, but there's really no personal risk. It's stretching outside of your comfort zone and, and changing. And uh, in some unfortunate cases, you know, people leave an organization and those are the people who do, don't want to be better or be challenged. And, you know, I, I tell them in, in some cases, they might be better off without those kind of people because they contribute to a little bit of a, a cancer culture. <laughs> Makes sense. So how do you help them get past those fears? I tell them to connect. And me personally, I, it's relationship-based. 
And uh, whenever people approach me and they say, how do I know what kind of coach to work with? I tell them to evaluate character over credentials. Credentials meaning their qualifications. You know, if, if all you're looking to do is develop yourself and develop your people, then ask them what it is that they're doing to develop themselves or developing their people. Uh, there's also got to be a connection. People want to do business with people they know, like, trust, and, and know can help them. So you don't have to feel safe and without judgment, you know, just be open, express fears, concerns, any objection you might have about the coaching process, you know, put it on the table because a good coach uh, will have heard it before <laughs> and will explain exactly how to, you know, get through it. Okay. What are other perceived obstacles do you see when it might prevent leaders from, or organizations from seeking out the help of a coach? The cost, I always tell people that there's a difference between an investment and an expense. Um, yeah. But there's, there's also a lot of variables to coaches' pricing. It depends on the experience, the demand for their time, the size of the company they're working with, you know, t- the time frame, uh, travel, so on and so forth. But when it comes to a business or an organization and its growth, it's, it's like what, what costs more, investing in this upfront or expensing it after to, to fix a huge problem after. Some people think the coaching process takes too much time and I don't know anything worthwhile that doesn't take a lot of time, especially if I'm brought in after a, a problem has arose. But if your business or your organization isn't worth investing your time in, it's probably not going to be worth mine or any other coach's time either. You know, if if a crystal ball showed you that the next five years of struggle and constant investment and then 50 of longevity and success and growth, there, there really wouldn't be a question. So you just have to know that there is a time commitment and you got to be in it to win it. I like it. I think you need a t-shirt that says that. I'm in it to win it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so what are some little known pitfalls or maybe mistakes that you see leaders in small business organizations making? And are there any common denominators? Sure. It all revolved around this, this value gap. I think leaders, current leaders, don't really understand the power of developing every single one of their people's potential and how it impacts the holistic growth and success of the company. So if I had to, you know, kind of categorize a denominator, I would definitely say mindset and attitude, which really boils down to an awareness issue, if you ask me personally. But, you know, just having that attitude that, again, investing in people is an expense versus an investment, so you limit it or thinking that good work is, is hard to come by, kind of playing that, that victim role, or that other organizations have better people, more talented, more able people, like I said before, wanting the quick fix with little effort, or just contentment in general. And, uh, you know, I come across companies that are growing, and they say, we're okay, and they want to avoid stretching because there's not this urgent need, but they're selling themselves short by not knowing what else they're capable of, really. So how can some of these pitfalls and mistakes be avoided? It definitely starts at the top, which is challenging for coaches and leaders. We're talking about a paradigm shift in the mindset. I talk about awareness because it's the most important, most daunting, and sometimes takes the longest uh, in the coaching process. But I like to use something that I call like the GPS model. And it's, it's very, you know, it's, it's easy. I just come into a company. Again, we're back to that observation. I look to see the current location like a GPS has, right? Where individuals and teams are currently at. I look at the destination, you know, where they want to be or where they need to be. I look at the route, which is, you know, the available paths to getting to that destination. But then I start recalculating the route if it's needed. You know, we, we look at how the trip's going, are there detours, is there construction? And really, I develop and implement those action and accountability plans that keep them on whatever course they're supposed to be on. And from a leader perspective, you know, somebody who's running a company right now, and they want 
to consider doing something like this. It's all about commitment, openness, and willingness. And I tell people all the time, you know, sometimes it's a fake it till you make it mentality. If you don't believe in your people, which, you know, I'm, a, I'm sad, but I can help you. If you don't believe in your people, though, you can borrow my belief in them until you do, because I know that eventually you will. Okay. Can you give me a quick example of how you help a client actually develop personally or professionally or as leader and how it has impacted, you know, the success of their business or organization? Sure. So I, uh, earlier I mentioned the, the force mul- multiplier, the, the military term, and that's because I work with several veteran uh, business owners in the area. And it, it's amazing because from a profile perspective, th- these are very, very competent leaders. I mean, they live in awareness, action, and accountability because for them on the battlefield, it was life or death, right? But In business, there's different rules, different urgencies, and and different consequences and obstacles. So it was really about reshaping their identity, you know, going back to that awareness for them. And there were just issues in, you know, developing a vision or a mission, relationship building, problem solving, stuff that, that there are issues that are in every business and organization. But after we went through this, we discovered their strengths and their resourcefulness as business leaders and it shifted their focus. So one of the people developed just these automated systems and processes. It's a technology company, but it saved them a lot of time and money. Another one kind of redefined roles and responsibilities for people who are working in the business, set up accountability plans, and that saved a lot of time because everybody wasn't doing each other's work anymore. In, uh, communication is always huge and their situations, these vets, you know, it was about setting expectations and managing the results of the team. So uh, this whole process really just put them all in position to be pursuing these different growth projects that they didn't even plan to do when we started. And it, that's where it goes back to the potential the possibility. It's like they freed up all this time and money. Now what does the next step look like? And now they're, they're finally launching into those steps. So what exactly inspired you to become a coach? I was coaching before I was technically certified. That's why I tell people go for character over credentials. So I was um, in a chamber of commerce. I was helping business owners. They approached me because I'm young and they thought they had marketing issues. And the long story short was they were not marketing issues. They were development issues. And at the time, I had undergone my first dissolution in business. And it was devastating because they were friends of mine. And uh, I was just deciding what I wanted to do next. I knew it wasn't in the financial industry. But I hooked up with some people actually at, at the chamber. Uh, actually, the executive director of the chamber and I worked together fairly closely. And he became my coach and then my business partner. And we got certified together. And the rest was just history. But initially, I did it because I recognized, or I should say I was recognized as being good at it. I I didn't know it was my passion. I knew it was different. And I knew it was exciting. But now, after, you know, years of of really evaluating my experiences and everything, it's put it into perspective that I have been a product of coaching my entire life. Okay, so can you explain to me maybe or share one of the most important lessons you've learned early on that still impacts what you do today? Just believing. Well, the lesson is that I don't want to say to not necessarily believe it, but people, people will always say that they want to do something or that they will do something. And more often than not, they don't do it. And I say that as a reminder for myself, only because in my transformational process, in my development as a leader, I remember this one particular instance in Orlando a couple of years ago, and my partner had essentially recognized something that I said, and it had to do with trust in our business relationship. And I had said something along the lines of, I trust you, you know, so on and so forth. But the fact that I said it was, was actually kind of contradictory and he, he picked up on it. So it was this out of body experience for somebody to realize that I was 
saying something in that case, but I didn't necessarily mean it. And and that's that's really what I I bring into businesses because there's a lot of things that people say they want to do. And my job is to figure out whether or not that is really what they want to do and make it happen. Okay. Well, I got two more questions for you and I'm really intrigued to know the answer. What is the most important thing that a leader or a business organization should consider when evaluating a coach? Like, let's just say they're looking for somebody to help them go next level with it. What are the things that they should look for? I, I always go by the person first. You know, most coaches, though, they have clients who are willing to have conversations, almost like a reference. So I always put that on the table, too. If they want to speak to any of my clients and they're happy to do so, just do your homework. You know, I'm, I'm a networker, so I like connecting face to face. But LinkedIn is a very powerful tool. There's a lot of good, um, good resources out there to find a coach. What is the most important thing that leaders in business organizations should consider when evaluating a coach? Is it personality? Is it, you know, training? Is it, you know, a resume? What is it that they should be considering and evaluating before they decide to hire somebody out? Because it is a big investment. I would say testimonials are good. References are also good. A lot of coaches have clients that are ready and willing to have a conversation with somebody else who's about to hire them about their experience. But the number one thing, personality, it's obviously important. As far as looking for a skill set, though, I always tell people, good coaches already know that you have the answers. Not that they have the answers, but that you have the answers. So if you hear a coach saying, I advise, or I told them to do this, you know, it, it may be a red flag just to reconsider finding somebody else only because our, our job is to help our clients come to the realization that they do have the answers to all of these uh, issues within them. We're not advisors or consultants or mentors or any of that. That completely makes sense. You're definitely not psychic. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> me and you would have a whole different conversation. But if somebody wanted to get a hold of you for your services, how would they go at doing that? So I am all across social media, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. Uh, you can find me at Coach Lich, L-I-C-H. And on my website, which is www.annalichnowski.com. And if you go on my website, there's actually a coaching intake form where it's like 15 questions. And I always tell people, bring your story to the table and take me up on a complimentary session. I was going to ask you about that. So you give out a complimentary session to what, 30 minutes or 20 minutes or? Uh, usually I do 60 to 90. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Nice. Just to make sure you guys are a right fit. Well, awesome, Anna. Like, seriously, I completely enjoyed our interview today. I love the information that you have given. Again, guys, this is Coach Lynch. Her contact information will be here at the bottom. And, and Anna, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, Alicia. I really appreciate it. All right, guys. You just heard from your host, Alicia Debrell from Insight Media. Until next time. Thanks for listening to Business Innovators Radio. To hear all episodes featuring leading industry influencers and trendsetters, visit us online at businessinnovatorsradio.com today.